I'm sure as I stand before you tonight, every one of you could share numerous testimonies of people in your world, in your sphere, family, close friends, that are going through incredible pain and suffering. My dear friend Chuck, in Northern California, 37-year-old daughter, got in a little golf cart accident, or injured her hip, hip never healed, goes to the doctor and they discover that she's got fourth level bone cancer all the way through the hip. And this is such an aggressive cancer. They go through chemo, they go through radiation, every known cancer cure. Nothing happens that helped her. And so now for the rest of the days that she has, she's been a total amputee from above her, above her hip. Now she has to learn to walk. Those are the kind of questions you want to say, God, why? Why? It's not fair. Have you heard that? It's not fair. How can a God, how can a God of love allow that to happen? Well, friends, during the 6,000 years of this earth's history, there's been a lot of heartache and pain that has come and gone. We don't need to sit here and think that we are unique. Let me tell you about Clara Anderson. Before we get started, though, please, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, right now, we just want to take a little time out. Lord, just clear our mind for all the clutter and the garbage that's out there in this world. And help us just for a few minutes now to set aside those distractions, and allow your spirit to speak to us and to fill us. Lord, we're opening your word. We've discovered that we can trust your word. We can rely on it. Be with us tonight. We thank you and pray. Amen. Clara Anderson was a maid in San Francisco. And Clara was a very gentle woman very conscientious. And one day, after working for the same employer, the same house that she cleaned and and cooked for, for 15 years, she disappeared. They had no idea where she had gone. They searched and they searched. I mean, she just seemed to have totally dropped, dropped out of sight. Miraculously, After several days of searching, they found her. Clara was in the process of starving herself to death. Out in the mountains, out in the hills, outside of San Francisco. And she said, I want to die. Leave me alone. And when the reporter who found her interviewed her, Clara said, Look, nobody cares about me. I'm just a maid. I'm nobody. I'm just one of thousands of of people here in this society just doing menial tasks. I don't mean anything to anybody. My life is of no value. I, um, I have no close relatives, no family, no friends. I am so lonely that I just don't want to live anymore. That's a pretty dark picture, wouldn't you say? There's no one that I consider close enough to me, nobody that I can talk to, nobody that I can open my heart to. Just let me die because nobody really cares. Wow. I can honestly say, I can't get my mind around that kind of emptiness. Because I praise God, God has put so many wonderful people in my life, my kids, my family, my friends, that call me and talk and we, and we nurture and, and we encourage each other. 
That, that, that's, why, that's what church is all about, friends. We're here to encourage and to talk and to, and to share. Nobody cares is a cry that is heard desperately by men and women all around this hurting planet. So why is there so much pain? So many broken hearts, so many broken homes, so many tragedies, so many accidents and disasters. I mean, if God exists, why doesn't he take care of this? Why doesn't he put an end to all this stuff? But the bigger question is, is he responsible for the difficulties that we have to endure? We're going to answer that question this evening. See, many people are surprised to hear that the Bible makes it very plain, describes a great battle that is going on between the powers of good and the powers of evil. And it clearly indicates that there is one who is entirely responsible for all the pain and suffering that we see around us on this planet Earth. And the good news is, it's not God. You see, Jesus told the story I love this story. He told the story about this farmer who planted good seed in his field. But when the plants came up, guess what? There are a whole bunch of noxious weeds and, and plants that weren't invited that were growing with the, with, his, with the good seed. And Matthew 13, 27. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Well, how then does it have tares? Tares, that's a biblical term for weeds. Why is there weeds? Where did the weeds come from? Where did the tares come from? They wanted to know. And so he continues in Matthew 13, 37. He answered them and said to them, He who sows the good seed is what? the son of man. The field is the good, is the world. The good seeds are the, are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares, the bad seed are the sons of the wicked one. Do you get that? And then in Matthew 13, the enemy who sowed them is pure and simple right there. The devil. There's the enemy who sows the bad seeds. Now, you see, while God is trying to show love and kindness to everyone, there's another power at work in this world bringing disaster and bringing pain and suffering and death, sickness into the lives of God's children. We talked about this the other night. Even insurance companies have it wrong. They don't have a policy that says, here's the acts of the devil, ba da 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 No, acts of God. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, gives us a clear picture of the origin of evil. And it may surprise you, but there once was a war in heaven. Now, I don't know what kind of weapons they used, but the Bible in the book of Revelation describes that there was a war in heaven. Revelation 12, a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, Michael, that's another word for for. God is host, and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now, I know there's many students of the Bible here that understand that that symbol of the dragon refers to the devil. Well, we can read about it. Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, so there's the definition right there, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So it makes it pretty plain, doesn't it? Where evil originated. Now, I don't know about you, but I sure wish there was some way that God in his infinite wisdom Wisdom would have said, you know, okay, right now, I'm going to take care of this problem here because I know what it's going to happen, what is, how it's going to affect people on planet Earth. I 
wish there was a way he could have done that. But, it says his angels were cast out with him. Now, now notice how this dragon or the devil is introduced in Revelation 12, 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw, and drew, and threw them to earth. So evidently, according to the book of Revelation, a third, I don't know how many gazillions of angels there were, but a third of those angels followed this deceiver in his rebellion against God. I don't know what that says to you, but if I'm a... God's creative beings were angels, men, animals. So the angels were one step lower than God. They were created beings. And they got to view for themselves God and his character of love. Satan, Lucifer, must have been pretty crafty. He must have been pretty sly to deceive a third of the angels. They hadn't seen sin. They, hadn't, they didn't know what even what sin was. But they rebel against God. Now let's find out more about this fallen angel, the leader of this cosmic rebellion. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, he's described this way. Thus says the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. Perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Ezekiel continues, you were the anointed cherub who covers. You were in the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Friends, the reality is, Lucifer was an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful angel, created perfect in all ways. He held one of the most exalted positions in heaven. On either side of the, of the mercy seat, we understand, or the throne of God, were two angels, one on the right and one on the left. Lucifer was one of those. Talk about an exalted position, but it wasn't good enough. He wasn't content at being next to God. He wanted to take God's place. He wanted to be God. So pride and jealousy began this rebellion in Lucifer's heart. And God said to Lucifer, Ezekiel, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in your heart, was found in you. Iniquity, that's evil, sin, wrongdoing. Your heart was lifted up because your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So the fact is, this guy was all full of himself. I'm going to pause here for a moment. Have you noticed how things really haven't changed much in our world today? Who are some of the most, quotes beautiful people in our culture? Hollywood. Second question. Where does most of the evil that's depicted in every kind of movie or on the internet, where do most of the evil of this world, where does it originate? In Hollywood. You compare me and I, when I was a kid growing up, you know what the number one show on television was? Leave it to Beaver. You look at Leave it to Beaver now and you compare it with the absolute filth and trash that's on there, you go, whoa. And that's just in a matter of a few decades. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So here this beautiful, exalted angel became self-centered. Pride goeth before fall. I don't know who came up with that, but bingo. 
And he coveted the glory and worship due to God, his creator, alone. He became self-centered. And he even had the boldness to challenge his creator. Can you imagine that created challenging his creator for the throne of the universe? Listen carefully. Again, in the book of Isaiah. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. You get the picture? Well, it wasn't very long before Lucifer's influence. That's those subtle, um, subtle and not so subtle digs against God began to spread the spirit of discontent in heaven among the other angels. Just, I mean, it's like, like rotten fruit. You ever had a, stuck an apple in a basket and, the underside of it gets it rotten and you don't pay attention. Before you know it, you're throwing the whole thing out. And that's the way it was in heaven. Surely, but slowly, he undermined God's love and God's justice. And just like rotten fruit in a box, his rebellious spirit spread to other angels in heaven. Why? Perhaps you're wondering why God... Why did, you, why did you just throw the devil out of heaven instead of just saying, you know what, that's it, you're gone. I'm going to figure out a way to destroy you, to eliminate you, because I can't let this happen. Well, this reveals one of the most incredible aspects of God's character. I mean, let's face it, have God had done so, then the rest of his creatures, the rest of those angels, would have served him out of fear. They would have they wondered, am I going to be next? You see, God is a God of love. And love only exists where there is freedom. We have three children and five grandchildren. And we'd be happy to show you their picture and brag on them. But those of you who had kids... How many of you would like a child that you basically programmed to obey everything you said? Now, don't raise your hand too quick. <laughs> I mean, your child would wake up in the morning uh, and say, Yes, Mommy, I'll eat my Brussels sprouts and spinach. Yes, Daddy, I'll clean the house. And I'll actually scrub in the toilets. And at certain times, they were all programmed uh, to, to say, Yes, and I love you very much. How many of you would like a child like that? <laughs> like, a, like a robot, a mechanical robot that you can't even really have a relationship with? I'm not sure how you develop love in that kind of an arena. I don't know about you, but I would not want that kind of a child. And neither did God. There'd be no love. See, because God is a God of love. He can only be happy in a love relationship with his creatures whenever they worship him. This God of love that we studied a few nights ago. God gives every, everybody, every created being, the power of choice to obey or disobey. Freedom of choice is number one on God's scheme of things. As I said, if it wasn't, he'd have taken care of it way back then. Freedom of choice. That's number one in God's scheme of things. I don't have this on my notes, but I'm just going to drop a little, a little tidbit in the bucket here. Freedom of choice 
Look what has happened here in America in the last three years. Freedom of worship, freedom of assembly, freedom of choice. This is not a discussion about whether the vax is effective or not, but that freedom was taken away. We have lost freedom of, of speech. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to connect the dots to see how quickly the end time events could unfold in this planet and we no longer have power of choice, our freedom of conscience. That's a topic for another time. But see, God honors our freedom of choice. That's more important than anything. And out of fairness, God has allowed Satan to demonstrate to the universe the way Satan would run the world. He's allowed him that freedom. So the battle that began in heaven, however long ago, it's not over. It's just changed places. This earth is now the ground, ground on which this great controversy between good and evil is being fought. It's this earth that is example number one to the whole universe. Is it God's character or Satan? But again, why the earth? Why did our planet have to become the spectacle to the world both angels and to men. This earth came from the hand of our creator and all of its splendor and all of its perfection and all of its beauty was beyond description. A spectacle to the whole universe and although Adam and Eve, father and mother of, of the human race, were created perfect, they were not placed beyond the possibility of messing up, of wrongdoing, because God also gave them the same freedom that he gave Lucifer and all the heavenly hosts. They were also created with this freedom to choose to love and follow God or not, or to ignore his instructions. But their loyalty would be tested. And that test, as we know, took place in the Garden of Eden, a single tree. So God warned Adam and Eve, and he says, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now that was a very simple formula, simple instructions. Now they must have felt quite secure in that garden. However, as many of you understand, we become most vulnerable when we become self-confident and we feel secure. And that is exactly what happened to Eve. See, Satan, Lucifer, the enemy, used this supernatural power he had to deceive her. As he often does, he works very slyly, deceitfully. And so he's coming to her in a form that she won't recognize. Now, Satan rarely works openly. He uses organizations. He uses people. Uh, he even used a serpent. And so Eve, she's in that garden. And this serpent... God didn't create this serpent to talk, but, whoa, what's going on here? This serpent starts to talk to her. She never suspected that words would be coming from this snake, but Satan, Lucifer, was using that snake as a, as a way through which to speak. And the devil, speaking through that serpent, asks her, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve replies, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, 
You shall not eat. And then the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. And as Eve listens, she listens to the serpent, it must have crossed her mind that he was saying something quite different than what God had told her. And so perhaps sensing that this confusion, the enemy suspects that she's being confused at that very moment. He hurriedly, he hurriedly adds, God knows that in the day you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. In that musical flowery voice that the serpent had. Your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Good and evil, rather. Thank you. Knowing good and evil. So the, the devil suggests that God was being unfair. That he was holding back something really good that Eve needed to experience. And that Eve was, that she desired. What the devil said at that moment seemed to make a lot of sense to Eve. Genesis 3, 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, you see, she bought the line right there, didn't she? She bought the lie. She took of its fruit and ate it. And then, of course, we know that Eve gives the fruit to Adam and he eats it. So both Adam and Eve flunk this test, this test of love and loyalty that God had established in that garden. And it wasn't very long before they knew that something was terribly wrong. Satan had hijacked this newborn world. And he could now claim the title of prince of this world. It was now his. Adam and Eve were disobedient to him. Because Adam and Eve, I'm sorry, because Adam and Eve were obedient to Lucifer and not to God. That's where they failed the test. Now as most, as this most tragic day drew to a close, I don't know whether this temptation happened in the morning, noon, afternoon, or whenever. But God came in the cool of the evening, as usual, and he called upon Adam and Eve. Now, until now, this cool of the evening had been the happiest time of the day for this couple in Eden. They loved to walk and to talk directly with God. Can you imagine? They had the ability to talk directly to their creator who had created them, all the beauty around them. But now this day, for some reason, they find themselves running and hiding. Finally, Adams, he slips slowly from the hiding and he confessed. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam had never been afraid before. Fear was never something even experienced. But that is what sin does. It even makes a person afraid of God. Genesis 3, God replied, Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God didn't have to ask that question. That's a rhetorical question. And Adam answered, notice his answer. That woman you gave me, that woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. A few hours before, Adam had, Adam had been willing to die with Eve. And now he blames her and also blames God for creating her. 
You get that picture? How sin totally shatters a perfect love. Now, he was no less accusing. You see, when God asks her what she had done, she replies, oh, that serpent that you created, I'm blaming you, God, that serpent you created, deceived me and I ate. So Eve puts the blame on God too. In other words, she was saying, it's the serpent you made that got me into trouble. Have you noticed the culture in which we live in today? How very few people are willing to claim responsibility for their actions where they are going in life. It's always somebody else's fault. And I don't need to get political here, but look in the political arena. I mean, there's not one person that raises anything, you know, I'm taking responsibility. Talk to a drug addict. I guarantee you somewhere along that conversation, an abusive father or some unfair priest or something is going to come up that they're not taking personal responsibility. How sin totally shatters perfect love. Eve was no less accusing when she said it was a serpent's fault. And that very day, Adam and Eve were doomed to die. To keep Adam and Eve from eating of the tree of life, God said he evicted them from their garden home. The devil said they wouldn't die. But the Bible says so in the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So it took a few years to prove the devil wrong. But Adam and Eve both died. So that great lie was substantiated centuries later. A lot of people ask, you mean people back then lived? Is that, is that the same 930 years that we would have today? Are, are you telling me that if, that if Adam and Eve were alive today, they were born like somewhere around the, the 10th and 11th century? Yes, that's, that's correct. That's a topic for another time. You mean they were like nine and ten feet tall? Yes, they were, or even larger. This is totally off the script here, but I have a friend of mine who worked, who worked with the Smithsonian for many years, and he says there's a whole area of the Smithsonian that's, that's never been displayed to public, but are literally hundreds of giants, skeletons of giants that are 10, 12, 13 feet long, that would totally destroy the, you know, the evolutionists and the, uh, you know, fill in the blank. But then he died. Now, it's very easy to blame God for the world's heartbreak and the devastation that's, there, that's out there. But Satan is really responsible for this havoc. And Jesus unmasked the devil and the way he afflicts people. As he was teaching in his synagogue one Sabbath, as was his custom, he noticed a woman in the synagogue bent over, crippled with a deformity. The Bible tells us that Jesus was touched by her pathetic circumstances, and he touched her and he healed her. And guess what? The church leaders, the scribes, and fair, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they began instantly to criticize him because the healing took place on the Sabbath, God's holy day of worship. You have to understand that there's a lot of things that have not changed over the 2,000 years that Jesus was on this earth's history. There are many, many people who are much more concerned about the letter of the law than they are than the spirit of the law. The Sadducees and Pharisees, they knew that law backwards and forwards. 
they invented so many laws that they made it a total burden for the people in the church. So what does Jesus say? Notice how he defends his actions. He says, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Jesus himself points directly to the fact that this woman's ailment, her diseases, her pain and suffering for 18 years, who's responsible? Satan. Satan was the guilty one. In fact, Satan's, he's the sinister force behind all diseases and all sufferings and all heartache and all death that we see in this world. He is the author of that. Perhaps nor in the Bible do we see Satan's strategy more clearly exposed than in a story that, oh, when you read it, wow, this, uh, this story gets to me. It's the story of Job. In the first chapter of Job, in a conversation between that, uh, this, I, I've, I've muddled this over my mind a little bit. How did, how did the Lucifer, how did Satan become part of this conversation? But it happened between the devil and God sometime after the fall. Satan was there in a meeting in heaven. And Satan comes, comes and, he, and, and he has a part of this whole conversation. Think of that. A meeting of the sons of God and Satan comes uninvited. And the Lord said to Satan, well, from where do you come? In other words, who invited you? <laughs> what right do you have to be here? And what does Satan answer? From going to and fro in the face of the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So here Satan claims dominion over the planet earth. He gives the Lord the impression, I've been, I've been enjoying myself on my, in my world. He had taken over Adam's position. So Satan's claim to represent, to represent earth did not go unchallenged. And the Lord says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Job had to be a pretty impressive guy. So the Lord, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So what a challenge we have here. Satan claimed that the only reason Job was loyal to God was because of what God did for him. Job was a very successful, very rich, successful person. Not because just in that whole culture, you had those who were exist you had the the upper class, and then you had all the servants. Job was not a servant. But he accuses him that he's got all these, that he's serving God because of what God did for him, not because he loved and trusted God. That Job, his wealth and his success had nothing to do with God. He had a wife and family, all the things that anyone could have wanted in that culture, in that time. And so here we read in Job 1.12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person. So here God is removing his protective presence from Job, and he's giving the enemy access to do whatever he wants to Joseph. Just don't kill him. Don't lay your hand on this person. Don't do anything to him physically. So Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord. He left, he goes eager to get his hands on Job's possessions. The blows and the pain and the anguish in Job's life soon begin to fall. First, the Sabaeans stole Job's cattle 
and they murdered his workers. The second tragedy, lightning struck, killing all of his sheep and his shepherds. The third strike, the Chaldeans come and they plunder Job's camels. The fourth and the most heartbreaking news, this tornado comes, demolishes the home of Job's oldest son. A party was on. All 10 of Job's children were killed. And here's poor Job. He thinks that the Lord has totally abandoned him and has taken away all of his possessions and he's caused all this heartache. He didn't understand the devil had done it. And even although he was overcome with grief, believe it or not, Job's loyalty to God was unchanged. Job 1, he said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Although he, he couldn't understand the tragedies that devastated his possessions and his children, Job trusted in God's goodness just the same. But Satan wasn't through with him yet. He challenged God again saying, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch your hand, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. We know what happened. So the test is on. Job would remain loyal to God when things got so bad. The question, would he turn his back on God? So Satan went out for the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Whoa, have any of you ever had boils or something that's close to it? I tell you, you spell pain with a capital P. Imagine being covered with these boils from head to toe, but Job remains loyal and faithful to God. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Whoops, there we go. So the question, easy answer, who is it that that plagued Job? Satan, who brought the tornadoes, destroyed his son and daughters? Satan, who stole his livestock and, and killed his servants? Satan. You see, the Lord may allow difficulties to come to test our loyalty and love, but Satan is always the one responsible. God, he has a way of taking a defeat and turning it into a victory. God is the one who can take something that has really challenged us in our journey that has been a difficult experience for us and something good can come out as a result. As I shared the other night, back in that culture, time of Job, their whole mindset was that if God allowed something to happen, he was personally involved in doing it. If God allowed it, he did it. That's the way the scribes and the writers, that's where they penned it. But the fact was that God was not actively involved. Friends, you and I this evening are caught up in the center of this cosmic drama that is being played out in this earth. This conflict between good and evil. This conflict between authority and and lawlessness between the creator and Satan, the original rebel, of course. But the fact is we're not just spectators. We are, all of us are involved. Whether we want to or not, the book of Revelation says this, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Peter wrote this warning. 1 Peter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That is so true. But the good news, friends, tonight, the good news is that God, the God of creation, has a plan of redemption for this lost planet. He has sent his precious son, Jesus, to defeat Satan and to redeem this planet that is in rebellion. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You see, the devil tried his hardest to get Jesus to fail, to overcome Jesus. He worked through King Herod to destroy the Christ child. He came to Jesus in the wilderness, masquerading as an angel from heaven with Three great temptations there in the wilderness, and he was defeated. He incited the crowd to destroy Jesus at Calvary, and he was defeated. And although, although Jesus died on Calvary, he rose again. And Satan then became defeated. Praise God. Satan became the defeated foe. Christ, by his death, and his resurrection earned the right to destroy all evil and suffering. And the issue is today, who will we believe? Who will we follow? A loving God or a fallen angel? Where is our loyalty? Whose side are we on? You may be wondering about sorrow and heartache and difficulty in your own life. You may be wondering about the loss of a child or, or a loved one and asking, you know, where's God? Where's God? Friends, to every restless, lonely heart, to every aching, guilty soul, to all of his children on this planet Earth, on this planet that's in rebellion, Jesus gives a loving invitation. He says, come to me. Both hands stretched out with those nail prints so visible. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Joseph Scriven was an Irishman born in the mid-1800s, a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin. He was very well educated came from a good family. Joseph's life seemed to be going very well. He met a beautiful young lady. He fell in love, was engaged to be married. But the evening of the wedding, his fiance slipped and fell from a horse while crossing a bridge while he waited on the other side, and she drowned in front of him. Before she could be rescued, she was gone. After this terrible tragedy, Joseph left Ireland and moved to Port Hope, Canada, where he taught and he tutored and he eventually fell in love again. But again, tragedy struck as his sweetheart fell, fell ill of pneumonia and died before they could get married. And then, to add to his woes, after hearing of his mother's ailing health back in Ireland, he was unable to go back there to visit her. Joseph wrote a poem for his mother, which he entitled, Pray Without Ceasing. We all know the words to that poem. It's the words to that song. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. <laughs> what a privilege 
to carry everything to God in prayer. Would you mind just lifting your voices with me right now and let's sing that song together. Would you do that? What? Uh, that's, can you put it in a little lower key? or do you, well, Then I'll sing bass. Go ahead. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not care. about you, but I'm not sure that I could write those words after having gone through not one, two, but three horrific experiences. But you know, maybe tonight you may be feeling like Joseph Scriven. You may feel today that the great controversy is not something merely written in the Bible, that it's it's going on in your own life right now. And you see that pattern in your heart. You've experienced it in your own life. I don't know what you're going through right now. Family problems, uh, trauma, marital problems. Maybe your kids are, maybe you raised children to, to know Jesus and they've now wandered. Maybe there's, problem with your, with your employer and, and your job and saying, God, this wasn't my idea of a, of a happy life. And you're wondering where God is. Are you there? God, do, do you hear me? I'm not exempt. We raised our three children to know Jesus. They all know a lot about spiritual things but there's not a day that goes by that I don't pray for them that they find their way back to Jesus God you know, I really need your help are you here maybe some of you gone through some financial reverses you know your credit card bills are mounting up you don't know what the future is going to be for your house payments and the inflation and all the craziness out there. Or maybe you're facing some health challenges. A lot of people are, a lot of us are. You know, I don't know where you are in this journey, but perhaps you need an extra dose of spiritual adrenaline tonight. Maybe you're having some symptoms that the doctors can't figure out. One thing that was for sure, these traumas, these challenges in your life, you need help and you need it from God. God is the only one that's the source, the solution to those issues in your life. So I'm gonna do something that I don't do, don't do very often. I just want, if, if you want an extra prayer tonight for the challenges in your journey, I'm just going to ask you to stand and come right down here with me. And we're going to sing that song again. Stand together as we have a prayer. If that's something that you would be comfortable doing, I invite you to come down here right now. Let's just gather in a, and we're, we're family here. We're family here this, this evening. And if you want to put your arm around someone, you want to grab someone's hand, the Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows your need. Father, 
today we have seen that you're not the one responsible for all the heartache and pain and suffering that's out there, but that you are a God of love. Lord, you're a God of freedom, a God of grace, a God of goodness. And today we, we recognize that we live in a world that is full of sin and suffering. And tonight we come to you as a family, as your children, just pleading and asking for your help. You know the needs of every heart here. You know the circumstances in our lives. You see the heartache. You, you know the difficulties. You understand our circumstances. And we just pray right now, Lord, that you would comfort us, that you would send your spirit into our hearts and into our lives, and we'll come to a realization, in spite of what the enemy is doing out there, that we can trust that you will see us through. Give us that extra grace to those who are right now crying to you for help, because you've promised to supply all of our needs. Lord, you're a God of love. And through Christ, Lord, make us faithful to you and your word. And may the day come soon when we'll be able to look you in your face and realize that all the suffering and the craziness of this world has now ended and that we can look to you in your face and cry with all those saints and the redeemed Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has come to save us. Lord, all we can say is just we give you permission to make us ready. We want to be ready. Lord, we open our hearts, our lives to you to whatever those rough edges that need to be chiseled by your spirit, Lord, we give you permission to do that. Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity you've given me to just share my heart. Lord, I love you. I want to do what I can on this journey to be, pot, be clay in the potter's hand, for you to mold and shape me, to shape us, to affect this world for eternity. So thank you again, Lord, for your incredible grace and mercy and love that in spite, of, in spite of all the evil and pain and suffering out there, you have promised us that it's coming a day soon where it will be all over. We want to be ready for that day, Lord. Amen. We pray in your name. And everybody said together, Amen. 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 You may quietly go back to your seats. Thank you for coming forward tonight. God sees your heart. He knows your needs, he knows the areas in your life that are bringing you pain and anxious anxiety. He knows the areas in your life that maybe you feel are out of control. Our job is just to keep, just keep holding on, to just keep holding on and to trust.